I love you being here this morning and uh, staying for our Bible class. And Jackie was having a lot of trouble talking this morning, <coughs> to tell on the phone. And uh, I tried to tell these guys it would help if you'd wear something on your head when you're outside. And he, he helped with the funeral yesterday and was a pallbearer. And, and uh, I thought it'd be some of you guys sick. Old Edward puts a, puts a cover on his chimney. And that helps me. And a doctor told me a few years ago that that would help anybody with sinus problems. So, Barbara, you remember that. <laughs> Have trouble getting her to wear anything. Don Carter, would you lead us in a prayer, please? Get her daily Bible reader account, please. <clears throat> because of such short notice, I, of course, didn't have time to review the lesson that you folks normally study up here. So you get two for the price of one today. If you have studied that lesson already, which I'm sure you did, uh, before coming to class. Uh, one of the wonderful memories that I have of my dad is uh, him sitting in the old rocking chair out on the front porch every Sunday morning reading the lesson from the Gospel Advocate Quarterly. He did that religiously for years. I don't know how many times he did it. Of course, in the wintertime, he'd sit inside uh, but the picture that uh, I've kept all these years is those Sunday mornings when it was warm weather and the days were longer and you could get up and go outside and sit on the porch and he would have been to the barn and fed and milked by that time, come back and eat breakfast, uh, got dressed for church services and would be sitting out there reading the lesson uh, while everybody else was getting ready and uh, <clears throat> so those studies in the quarterly are very beneficial and helpful and but we're we're studying in uh, our class downstairs some of the lessons from Genesis Genesis is the book of beginnings and we we've, we've learned of some of the beginnings and then we have uh, learned some really good faith building lessons from looking at uh, particular characters and we began to study last Lord's Day of uh, the man whose name <coughs> comes from laughter. Uh, the only uh, person in the Old Testament uh, and the Bible, so far as I know, named Isaac, son of Abraham and Sarah. And uh, there's so much to learn from him. I mentioned to the class down there that in 2013 there were 10,005 baby boys in the United States who were named Isaac at their birth and seven girls. You ever known a girl named Isaac? I have. But Isaac has become very prominent in our culture today. I have a great nephew named Isaac. He just recently was married. But... Uh, uh, you know, it's, it's a common name anymore. But it comes from, the name means he laughs. Uh, Genesis 17 and 18 tell us that both Abraham and Sarah laughed uh, at the prospect of having a child at their age. Uh, she was 90, Abraham was 100, and uh, Barbara told us all in class last Sunday that she wouldn't have been laughing, she'd been crying. And uh, we got a life out of that. 
But uh, the life of Isaac is a very exceptional life. It's a very interesting life. There's so many things that uh, are remarkable about his life. And I alluded last Sunday to some of the firsts uh, that are associated with the life of Isaac. Uh, we know him because he was the child who was going to be offered as a sacrifice. And that's about the only thing that most, uh, most people remember about him. Uh, but uh, you could say his birth was the first miraculous birth. Uh, here is a woman and a man, uh, as I said, 90 and 100 respectively, and they're given a son. And uh, both thought that that was very unusual, very odd, and it was. But God had said, you're going to have a child. And they kept waiting and waiting and had no child, and so... They began to start thinking about, well, now, how could we help God out? And Sarah had the idea, well, you could have a child, Abraham, by my handmaid, Hagar. And so that transpired. And Ishmael was born. God said, no, Ishmael is not the son of promise. He's you and Sarah are going to have a son. And think about all the problems that have arisen and are still going on, really, as a result of Sarah trying to help out God, getting ahead of God. You know, sometimes we wonder about things, even worry and fret about things that need to be left to God. You know, He'll, he'll take care of those things in time in his own good time. And it's hard sometimes for us to remember that. Uh, but this was, this was a first, the first miraculous birth. And then the second thing that happened to Isaac that was a first was, as far as we know, he was the first child that was circumcised at eight days of age. He began, he was involved in the beginning of, of circumcision. And uh, then too, uh, he was the one who was the, the first generation that would receive the promise of God that was given to Abraham. God renewed that promise three times. Abraham, well, he made it initially to Abraham. Then he renewed it to Isaac and Jacob. Have you ever noticed how many times that uh, in the Bible you'll read the statement that says, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? All three of them. I think one of the things that God is doing there is reminding those people of the certainty of what He said would take place. You know, I haven't made this promise just once. I've made it twice. I made it three times. And the Jews viewed Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as the three primary patriarchs. Those were the, the trio that they usually talked about. And uh, they were first in line. So uh, Isaac had that promise made to him as assuredly as his father received it. Then it would be renewed again uh, to uh, Jacob. There are some very exceptional qualities, too, that you think about. Uh, when you think about Isaac, he's the only of those three major patriarchs that kept one wife for life. Only one. Abraham... Had a child by Hagar. We've already talked about that. He would have children also by Keturah. He would father children with three different women. And we all know about Jacob, don't we? Twelve tribes of, ja of Israel came from four different women. And Jacob was the father of all of them. 
Twelve sons and a daughter, Jacob's father. But there were four women involved. Isaac loved and lived with Rebekah for all of his life. And their marriage and their, well, I don't know, it was an arranged marriage, but it worked out greatly. And uh, it, it just has today's Valentine's Day. And that was unknown at the time, but if there had been a Valentine's, then Isaac and Rebecca would have been one another's Valentine. I mean, they, it was love at first sight, you could say. And they lived together all those years and grew old together. But there's so many things that stand out about Isaac. He spent his entire life in the promised land. Lived with one woman all of his life. Lived in one place all of his life. Abraham and Jacob both left the promised land. Went to Egypt and other places. Isaac didn't. He dwelled right there. So he stayed throughout his life. The third thing about Isaac is that he lived longer than either his father or his son. In fact, he lived longer than anyone of whom we have knowledge after the flood. Abraham lived 175 years. Isaac bested him by five years. He lived to be 180. So he was blessed in that regard. Now these are some just amazing uh, examples of, of how exceptional a man and how exceptional a life Isaac lived. But somebody says, well, he didn't have the problems that we all have. He didn't have any problems like Abraham and, Isaac, or Abraham and Jacob had. Well, let's, let's think about that a minute. Isaac was a righteous man, wasn't he? But he was a righteous man in spite of family problems. You ever thought about that? He faced some serious family problems. You remember all the squabbling that went on and the arguing and the outright uh, just almost hatred, I guess you could say, that took place because of the, type of the situations involving the births of these two boys, Ishmael and Isaac. Do you remember that Hagar and Ishmael had to leave? Sarah said, y'all get out of here. When you read all of those events in uh, Genesis 16 and some other passages too, it's evident that Sarah and Hagar didn't get along. Now Isaac had to grow up in that situation. It's hard not to be bitter and not to be angry at someone that your parent is angry with. That's difficult, isn't it? We usually don't like whoever it is that mom and daddy don't like. And sometimes, you know, that can present a really strong temptation. Isaac was quote, the favored child. He was intended to be the child of promise. Ishmael never was. But do you ever find anything said about Isaac being unkind to Ishmael? Is it a problem between the boys? Or is it a problem between the mothers? 
It's more of a problem between the mothers, isn't it? They're not getting along. But what, what do children have the amazing ability to do? Forgive. They, they do. And, and sometimes they don't even realize there's a problem. You know, whether it's uh, in the realm of, uh, of social standing. I read a beautiful story about uh, this uh, little girl, you know, who uh, noticed this really dirty and grimy old man. He may have been homeless, I don't know, but she noticed him. And uh, she smiled at him. And, of course, any person that is not touched when a child smiles at them, there's something wrong with them, bad wrong with them, you know. You know how we, the kids go out with me. Just got to tell you this. John Christopher had been wanting to go out with me, and, and I didn't realize it, so I got him today. And then I picked up those two pretty little girls right back there. When I got back there, I was going to get them all three standing right in front of me side by side just like I always do the girls. John Christopher would have none of that. <laughs> he wanted to stand over to the side away from them. He said, uh-uh. <laughs> I mean, he told me, uh-uh. <laughs> but, you know, you let them get downstairs, get in the classroom, they'll be fine. But uh, it's just amazing at the qualities of little children. And so uh, Hagar was just a servant. She was a servant in the household. She was to do the bidding of somebody else. Ishmael was her boy. There's no indication that Isaac said, I'm the son of privilege, you know. There's, there's really something to be said for that. Now, a lot of us can identify with the feelings that Hagar and Ishmael must have had. You imagine being put out when really it was Sarah's and Abraham's idea that she bear a child by Abraham. And she being a servant was in a position to where pressure would have been great to have gone along with their desire because that's what servants did. And so you begin to appreciate Isaac a lot more because there's no real proof that he looked down on some people that would have been considered second-class citizens in their own family. And, you know, we need to learn a lesson from that about our attitude as Christians. You know, if, if you, uh, somebody comes to services, you know, and maybe they might be a little, a little bit disheveled and, and unkept and everything, do you go to them and talk to them and say, we're glad you're here? Or do we tend to shy away from them? Before Brother Bobby Woodard passed away, he <coughs> brought me a, uh, he gave me a uh, thing about uh, this denominational church who was looking for a preacher. And they were to get a, to get a new preacher. And uh, one Sunday morning, there was obviously a, a homeless man that came in, wouldn't shave, wrinkled clothes. I mean, he looked terrible. Had a picture of him. And, uh, boy, people avoided him, wouldn't speak to him. And uh, then after the service got started, uh, one of the gentlemen got up and said, uh, we want you to to meet uh, our new preacher. Probably called him a pastor. I want you to meet our new preacher. And uh, guess who got up 
and came to the front. This man had purposely done this, and there were a few that were in on it, just to see what the reaction of the people in that church would be to such an individual. And when he came to the front, oh, there were people gasping. Couldn't believe it. But then he told them, he said, you know, we don't need to be treating people like I've been treated today. There's a good lesson for all of us to learn from that. I think Isaac teaches us something about getting along uh, with other people. Sarah and Hagar were rivals of sorts. But there's no indication that, uh, that Isaac and Ishmael had a problem. They probably played together, ran together, did all those things that boys could do together, you know. And we need to remember that. But I, I like Isaac too because uh, he and Rebecca's love affair and marriage, their courtship, their marriage, and so on was a lifetime love affair. It was like a fairy tale. And there are several statements that indicate that Rebecca filled a place in Isaac's life that nobody else could. Remember, he just lost his mother. And there are statements made in the scriptures about the fact that, you know, evidently Rebecca filled a void there. And she, she became a very important uh, part of his life. And they faced disappointment too. They wanted children, and 20 years passed and they had no children. And then eventually, of course, they would have those twin boys. And in Genesis 25, uh, one translation says that Isaac pleaded with God for his wife. It is for her to have a child. And that tells you that he was intense in his prayers to God that he had learned from his father Abraham about the importance of worshiping and serving God. Remember when Abraham and Isaac took that, what must have been a, a very lonely walk to that mountaintop, and uh, that his father had said, let us go yonder and worship. So he had learned something about worship from his father and the importance of, of serving God. And so even though they wanted a child, uh, they did not despair. They did not give up. And uh, they, uh, Isaac rather turned to God. When we have problems in our families, when we have disappointments in life, we're, to whom do we need to turn? Where do we need to go? What do we need to do? Oh, we start wringing our hands sometimes and, and despair and give up and, and we start trying to work it all out in our own minds. And there are just lots of things that we just need to turn over to God. I remember, uh, I remember Scotty Yeagman making that statement many years ago. He said, you know, there's just there's things that we just have to let go of and let God handle it. And sometimes that's, that's very difficult for us to do. And I think Abraham and Sarah shows us that that's very difficult to do. We think we've got to work it all out, plan it all out, sort it all out, get everything lined up just right. I've known so many people that said, you know, when I, when I get a little older, why, I'll start attending services and, and I'll be more faithful to the Lord. And, or when I get feeling better, when I have the energy, whatever, well, you know, we, we may not get to that point in time. Uh, it's 
Seems like I remember a fellow that looked for a convenient time to become a Christian. From all indications, he never found it. So what we need to do is turn those things over to God. The psalmist said in Psalm 62, Trust in Him at all times. Pour out your heart before Him. God is a refuge for us. I think that's what we need to believe. Isaac was born to fulfill a promise that God had made. Nevertheless, his life was filled with anxiety and uh, with hurt even sometimes. Uh, I think I've referenced this before, but there is an article in an old gospel advocate many, many years ago written by T.B. Larimore, who was in many ways a prince of preachers insofar as eloquence was concerned. He was really amazing. I, I never heard him publicly or in person, of course, but I've read some of his writings. And this, this one particular article captured my attention because it was a very eloquent treatise on the trip that Abraham and Isaac took to go to where Isaac was to be offered as a sacrifice. And as only Larimore could, he, he talked about what this father and son must have talked about. And uh, can you imagine being that child, you know, and finding out that I'm going to be the sacrifice. I mean, he's bound. And his father's hand is raised. A lot of depictions has Isaac blindfolded. I don't know. But can you imagine that? What are you doing? Why are you doing that? So there were problems, moments in Isaac's life when he faced a lot of difficulties. Even though he was a child of promise, that didn't mean everything in his life was going to be hunky-dory in a bed of roses. We learn a great lesson there, too. Don't we? You become a Christian, some people think, now, that's it. I'm set for life. No more problem. That's not the way it works. And we would do well to remember that. Any of you have any comments? As they said, I'm done now. Have a good day.